Welcome to King's Church. Our uh, kind of theme, ethos, whatever you want to call it. I don't like mission. Mission is overused. Like, what's your mission? I'm just not into the word mission. Stop using that. Um, that's so 2019. <laughs> Speaking of being so 2019, have you noticed that the fashion is like exactly how I dressed in 1998 now? I walk in the diesel store and I'm like, this is, not that I would buy anything there, I just want to see what's happening. I'm like, this is me in 1998, like super ultra tight shirt with holes in it and then the like parachute pants that I could jump off a building and go down slowly. It's, it's, it's evil. Um, Revelation 1.6 says this, and he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion. So who, who has God made kings and priests? Us. Thank you, Royston. I like a little chatter. I'm okay with a little chatter back. You know, Josh, you know what I'm saying? He knows what I'm saying. And so part of the way we do that is like there's the, there's the king side and there's the, there's the priest side. The priest is God and man, that, inter, that intersection. And then the other king side is like, okay, there's also a world out here, and we're not just going to abandon it and let the people that want to do transgender surgery on the children run it. Like, we're going to actually be involved in both places, believe it or not. That's a Christian ethic, believe it or not. Well, one of the things we're doing that is we have this really cool media company that we're doing through the church called Lucid News, and we're talking about cultural issues, and we're doing testimonies. If you remember the 700 Club, we are calling this the 700 Club for Millennials. If you are older than a millennial, you're allowed to watch. If you're in Gen Z, you're not allowed to watch. Go put on your parachute pants. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I want to show a video of a clip that we did of uh, Tammy, one of our beautiful ladies here. Yep, go. One day I was on Instagram, <laughs> and I follow somebody by the name of David Harris Jr. He had um, put a clip up of him speaking at this church called King's Church in New York City, you know, because I respected him and what he was saying, and I knew he was a Christian. I looked up the church. I felt so much shame and so much guilt. I felt disgusting and dirty. So every time I would think about going to church, these thoughts of, you're disgusting, you're not worthy, you don't deserve it. And the truth is I didn't, none of us do really, we're all sinners. But it was preventing me from walking through those doors and it took me, took me probably like a year. I mean, it was this dance of the whole week and then Saturday, okay, I'm going to church, I'm going to church. And then I'd wake up on Sunday, I'm not going to church. I can't do it. Shame, guilt, I'm gonna burst into flames when I walk through those doors. <laughs> it was Palm Sunday of 2022 and I woke up and I'm like no I'm not listening to these lies anymore I have to I have to something's got to change something's got to give I got up I got dressed and I went to church and everything changed I walked through those doors and there's smiling faces everywhere saying hello and welcoming I mean nobody knew me and I'm like huh, <laughs> that's nice. And then during the message and the worship, I'm like, what is this place? I had never seen anything like that. I'd never seen a place where the presence of God was palpable. I didn't even know at the time what to call it. I now know it's the Holy Spirit. There was just so much joy and just I just knew God was there. And when I was listening to the message, it's just like, like an arrow piercing my heart and a flood of love. And I heard this voice just saying, I've been waiting for you. <sighs> um, I've been waiting for you. I've been knocking on the door of your heart for years. I chose you and I've been waiting for you. And um, so I was like, oh. You know, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that despite everything that I've done, you know, you say, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how much it is. We have all sinned. I have a lot of sin. Some have a little, but it doesn't matter. And that's why he came. And that's why he gave his life for us. And all that sin is nailed to the cross. Isn't that awesome? Tammy, can you stand up real quick? 
This is Tammy. You guys put your out your hands. We're going to pray for Tammy. God, we just thank you so much for Tammy and your call on her life. God, we thank you that you love her so much that you plucked her like a brand from the fire, God, that you grabbed hold of her heart, Lord. We ask for this year, huge blessing over her life. Incredible kingdom of heaven blessing. Relationships, finances, all of her needs met. God, we ask for the clouds to rise from the sea and rain down blessing over Tammy in Jesus' name. Amen, church? Amen. I love when she says, uh, Jesus was knocking on the door of my heart. Wasn't, isn't that amazing? And there are some of you here today where, that God is knocking on the door of your heart. And you don't want to answer it. Uh, but I can promise you, if you will trust him, it will be incredible if you open the door to Jesus. Amen? All right, so I, I'm just going to kind of ramble a little bit. I know we've been going through the book of Galatians, and I'll get to the text, but I just want to talk about a couple of other things before we get there. I, every once in a while in church, I like to talk about culturally relevant things. I think it's been a gigantic failing in, in the church that pastors haven't said, hey, here's this big cultural thing everybody's talking about. You're thinking about it all, all week, but I'm not going to mention it. I just think that's kind of silly, um, and we haven't done it well. So I want to mention that in one second. But first, uh, uh, King's Church is about growing big Christians. That's kind of our log line that we've been using, growing big Christians. It's talking about this kings and priests kind of combo, but really what is it is like that you would grow in Christ. Not that I would grow in Christ, but that you would grow in Christ. Not that I would meet your needs personally, um, but that you would find Jesus and learn how to get your needs met by the Holy Spirit and grow in Christ personally. Um, but we have a consumer culture and we have a consumer church. And so when people come to church, they think, well, I'm just hoping to consume. And then if the food's not that great, you know, at Arby's, then I'm going to go to Popeye's, right? And if it's not good at Popeye's, I learn about how they treat their chickens. It's not great. Don't eat Popeye's. I move on to, you know, grass-fed beef. And it's, it's all about my consumption, and that's what the church has been about and in the West, consumption. And the biggest churches serve the best grass-fed. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I'm just not interested in that. I'm not saying those are evil or bad. I'm just saying for King's Church and the people that call this place their home, we're not interested in that. We're interested in growing in Christ and saying, God, grow me and challenge me. I want to not be a baby. I want to grow in maturity in Christ Jesus. And this is what Paul says, well, let's see, the writer to the book of Hebrews, many theologians think it's Paul, we're not sure. The writer of the book of Hebrews says to the church of the Hebrews, um, the, the Hebrews in Diaspora, he says, uh, You're, I want to tell you about really cool guy stuff, smart, philosophical you know, Melchizedek-level weirdo stuff, esoteric stuff, but I can't because you're still babies. Like, you're still doing the basic stuff, and that's not a king's church. It's not us. It's not you guys. I mean, you guys preach on the streets and give and serve, and it's phenomenal, so thank you for that. Um, but I just, just to smash that idea a little bit, I just want to remind, remind you that when you're little, when you're a baby... You do need everything, yeah? Right? It's not like I say to my toddler, like, go make me a steak. But Leon, who's 15, can make me a steak. And he's pretty good at making steak, actually. You know, I cannot say to a toddler, you know, I want you to, whatever, read me a book. Goldie can read me a book. She's only seven years old. You know, there's levels where you are expected to develop independence, it doesn't mean you're not a part of the family anymore. You know what I'm saying? Like, for God's sake, please still be a part of the family. That's one of the tricks. You get independence and then you say, I don't need the church anymore. I'm now a super Christian. Like, that's really a bad idea. Because the church needs you. <laughs> the babies need you to help them grow. In a, in a big family, you're getting, the toddler's getting passed to aunt and uncle and mom, and they're playing with outside with cousins. And all of these people at all of these different developmental stages make development happen better. There's a study that came out that said um, there's like something like, it was, an, it was not a randomized study, but still just for anecdotal effect. There's a 70% increase in 
attention deficit disorder and other personality, let's call them ailments, um, for kids that were going to kindergarten separating from their mom and family at six, at 70, at seven years old, that number dropped by 70%. Okay? What does that mean? Oh, maybe uh, kids need moms. Maybe, you know? Uh, maybe, right? So when you're little, you need to be around people of faith all the time, and especially people that are more mature than you, right? Figure it out. And then as you get older in faith, you at some point hopefully become a parent and begin to multiply. Like that's the life cycle for a human being, right? They start out not being able, they don't even have the chemical ability to multiply. And then as they grow, they hit this you know, stage called puberty. You, you may have heard it before. And uh, then they have the ability physically to multiply. And that has not happened well in a consumer church, because a consumer church is just like, I just want to be fed only. If I'm not getting fed enough, I'm going somewhere else. And at King's Church, we're saying, you've been fed for 20 years. Go make some babies. You know what I mean? Not, unless you're married, not literally. <laughs> I'm serious about that. Um, Royce and I were talking about evangelism this morning. I just like... I was hitting this guy, that my waiter, this uh, earlier this week, Monday. I'm like, are you special forces or what are you, some kind of killing people guy? And he's like, no. I'm like, come on, seriously, tell me the truth. He's like, yeah, I was a Marine for five years. And I was, I was like, God's got a plan for your life, man. God's got something incredible for you. He's preserved you. And he says, I think God's been trying to kill me my whole life. And so we go after it. You know, we go in trying to pull brands out of the fire. It's scary. It's, uh, it's hard. It's what adults do in the kingdom of heaven. So um, babies are consumers. Adults are multipliers. And just think about that in, in, spiritual, in your spiritual life. God, am I just always consuming? Or can you take me to a place where I'm multiplying? And maybe it's not just evangelism. Maybe it's peace is growing in your, your office, right? Maybe blessing is growing and you can provide for people. And whatever it is, whatever gifts God's put in you, that, that you begin to multiply what? The kingdom of heaven and the world around you. Amen? Amen? Okay, good. Good pastor. Good point one. Where are we? We're like halfway through the message already. Keep going. Keep random in it. Okay, so heaven has a wall. Revelation chapter 21. Uh, um, we have an immigration situation happening in our country. It's, it's primarily because one political party has built its uh, political strategy on giving stuff away. And the more stuff I give away, the more votes I get. There is a philosopher named de Tocqueville, and he said, once the, once the American politician learns that he can buy votes with other people's money, it's going to be very bad for the United States of America. So like, okay, so, okay, we want people to come into our country, our city of God, our everything. Of course we do. Uh, but for the history of our nation, we've had made sure you're not a murderer or a rapist or um, really in debt or uh, sick or any of those kind of things. We're trying to grow... Uh, Amer an American polity. Actually, in the early 1900s, if you came to Ellis Island and you were sick or in debt or a criminal, they would just say, go back on the boat and go back home. You know, we have that fa famous thing like, bring me your teeming huddled masses. That's true, but there were still qualifications there, right? It wasn't like, bring me your teeming huddled murderers, because we don't actually want them. Heaven itself has a wall. Revelation 21. It's not my idea. I didn't create the idea of heaven. I didn't say heaven has a wall. Heaven actually has a wall has gi big giant doors with angels at it, and there are conflicting principles that are at attention for us, which is the doors are open, enter, come in. We want lots of people to come in. We want lots of immigrants to come in. We want them to come in legally. We want them not to break the infrastructure. We want, that, we want it to be in a way that we make sure, you know, there's uh, talking to Intel Special Forces guys two weeks ago, and they were telling me about a number of Central American countries where their prisons are empty because they're like, we don't want to pay for, we don't want to pay for these prisoners anymore. Go to America. See ya. And they're like, oh sweet, we just saved hundreds of millions of dollars. So, 
you can do the research on that at home. That'll be a fun QAnon rabbit hole for you to get arrested by the FBI on. Um, but, the, but the issue is we have a party that just is like, these are going to get me votes because we're going to pass bills that um, allow Im illegal immigrants to become legal and then vote as quick as we possibly can, and all of these people will vote for us. And so I don't like the idea of escapism. And political escapism is the same as religious escapism. It's like, I'm going to die, life is over, I don't care about my children and my children's children. I do. I care about my children and my children's children. So I want to build for them a church and a country where they're not saddled with debt, where they're not going to be crushed by demographic changes that are sweeping and not strategized. Um, I'm an immigrant. My, where my family's from New York City. My, my, my grandparents are from New York City. They all came off the boat. Italian, Portuguese, da-da-da-da. I'm, I'm not that far off. My ears aren't that dry. If you don't know what that means, like, you would say wet behind the ears, like you just came out of the, river, of the ocean and came to America. And so I love immigration, but I believe in this principle that heaven has a wall. In, in Revelation, why does it have a wall? It says to keep liars, the defiling, and all of these other things out of the heavenly city. And it's the same principle. And it's not, it's perfectly rational. It's, there's compassion and order. Like, bad arguments say, how dare you want order? You're only allowed to want compassion. No, sorry. Uh, that's not true. That is a misrepresentation of God and his kingdom. And then it's like, well, why don't you have compassion on the pedophile? and just allow him to create AI of your children X, Y, Z. Because it's a horrific, horrible, you know, stomach-churning evil. And so we don't have compassion on everything. We have compassion and order. We have logic and emotion. We have both of these things together. We don't divorce one. We're not cold and angry. We ask for both of them to happen at the same time. Amen? Does that make sense? Good. So last point on that is in, in, in ancient Israel, and so the Westminster Catechism says that we look to the Old Testament law to help kind of guide us. It's not binding. It's not like we're going to copy that law. That's not the theocracy thing. It's not that. It's, it's influential. And so in the Old Testament, there are, you, can become an, you can be an immigrant and come be a part of Israel, but you have to be a part of Israel. You have to accept God, Yahweh, as your God. You have to accept the laws of the land, all of those kind of things. So, so immigration was always about adaptation, about changing and saying, now I'm a part of this community, I'm building this community, I'm for this community, I'm with this community, and I'm building something that's important for my family and my family's family, my children's children. Amen? Sounds like a good idea. Okay, let's jump into Galatians 3, verse 10, very quickly, and I'm going to spend, I don't know, 10 minutes on it, I guess, and then I'll have the worship team come up, but in the book of Galatians, this is what's happening. If you haven't been here before, Paul started this church, and he's like, Jesus is the center. He's the most important. He purifies you, and then you follow him, walking like him, trying to be like him on the earth, all of that kind of basic Christianity stuff. These Judaizers come in. They're a group of people with a different philosophy that says, yes, and also you have to follow all of the Old Testament laws, circumcision, and a bunch of other stuff. And Paul is very angry at them. And so here in verse 10, he's going to more expressly say this statement, but he's going to say, those people should be eternally cursed. And that's a very obviously severe statement, but he's kind of building the argument right here. And so he says this in verse 10, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything according to this book. And so, in the Old Testament, this is referencing Deuteronomy uh, chapter 17, I can't remember. Um, and the, the blessing and the curse comes. And God's like, if you do all this stuff, you're going to be massively blessed. If you do all this stuff, you're going to be massively cursed. And so Paul's like, yeah, so if you do bad stuff, which you do, because you're human beings you're going to be cursed. And if you're relying on the law, you're going to be walking in a curse. And he says, but that's what Jesus came to free you from the curse, that you would be forgiven and cleansed and healed. You would forgive others and you would walk in, you know, cleanness, rightness, right relationship before God and man. God would lift all of the curses off of your life. Curses are still around, if you don't know that, if you're, you know, 
have only been bathed in secularism, which many of us have, curses are around, they're real, people walk in curses, it happens. I'll share about one of them in a little bit here. And so Aquinas says, as related to this passage, he says, as many are of the works of the law, i.e., whoever trusts in the work of the law that they would be made just by them are under a curse. So it's like, I'm not trusting Jesus like Tammy did. She put her trust in Jesus. I trust you to be my savior, that you would save me, have relationship with me, fill me with hope and peace. It's like, no, I trust in doing it perfectly. And if I do it perfectly, then I'll have peace. And then I'll have joy. And then I'll have... And many Christians, and obviously unchristians, non-Christians, live this kind of life cycle. You know, this rat race life cycle. Like, i got to get up at 4.45 a.m. And then i got a cold plunge. And I love the cold plunge. I'm a big cold plunge. I've been cold plunging since 2013. You know why? Because we lived in Jersey. And it was, the water was that cold in the shower. Like, I was early in on the cold plunge game, boosting my testosterone levels. Um, Whatever the stack of obligations are, that if you do them perfectly, then you'll have peace. That's really living in bondage. Those things become your master. If you slip on one, you fall into depression. I'm in the workout meme world. My boys work out all the time, and I work out some of the time. And, uh, but I've really been, I don't, my, alg my Instagram algorithm is always just about work out, working out and workout injuries, because I'm old. <laughs> I found out that I'm interested in looking up <laughs> at the injuries. And there's this one meme that has the guy, and um, do you remember Interstellar, where he's screaming and pounding on the thing? He's like, no, no! And he's like, me looking at uh, the time I'm about to get a shoulder injury. And he's screaming, because he's now depressed, because he... He's in a system where if he doesn't do this same thing every day, he falls into depression. That's what his life is about. That's his God. And that's bondage. Yeah. Whatever it is, it's bondage. Jesus came that we would be free from bondage. Yeah. Financial bondage. God, if I don't have this much in my bank, I'm depressed. That's bondage, friend. God, if I don't have a relationship... Like, this is a thing, I, I, there's guys, like the Romeo guys are like this. God, if I don't have a relationship, I'm depressed. That's bondage. Another person is not your savior. Yeah. Another person is maybe your helper, amen, but not your savior. And then, so, let's just look at this um, word in the Greek in the Strong's curse. We like to look at the original language. It helps us kind of be more accurate. It can make you a little wonky, but... Um, it, it is important to look at it. It says this, the usage is this, on whom a curse has been invoked, a curse, we know that, obviously. And then the definition, doomed to destruction. Well, I, what a great phrase, doomed to destruction. I mean, and there's, there's places in our life where, like, we know that's what it's like. Like, there's some people in this church who, in their financial life, they just feel like they're doomed to destruction. Like, I can never, like, money always leaves. I never have enough. Or my, same thing with job. Like, like, I'm doomed to destruction in my job. I keep getting fired over and over and over and over again. Or every relationship breaks down. It doesn't work out. It's doomed to destruction. I have a friend that's, you know, he's uh, an old high school buddy. And uh, I talk to him maybe once a year just to keep, touch, just to keep a touch point. And he's like, you know, I'm not, his girlfriend after girlfriend, it's like, are you going to ever get married? Is that like, you believe in that? You know, it's important for society kind of stuff. And he's like, yeah, it's not going to work out. In his mind, it's doomed to destruction, so he's never going to commit to it. And then it repeats a cycle of destruction. And so curses are real. They can come upon our lives as Christians. This is like, uh, the, the intellectual Christians are like, you know, Christians can't be cursed. Uh, we're, 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 Jesus took the curse. It's like, yeah, but you didn't appropriate the blessing. Yeah, but you're still, you still hate your parents, and so you leave room for curse to come upon your life. It says of Jesus, he made no place for the devil, but we make lots of place for the devil. If you don't know that Christians can be demonically oppressed, um, it's probably a, a demon that's telling you that. <laughs> Instagram clip, three, three ways, three ways for um, curses to get 
attached to you. One is unforgiveness, Matthew 6, 14, 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespass, neither will you, your Father forgive you your trespass. I hate my dad so much. He left my mom. I'll never be like that son of a gun ever. And then I don't know what, why my life is just repeating my dad's behavior. It's unforgiveness. Like, it doesn't matter how horrible you, someone was to you, you still have to forgive them. I was in um, Phoenix this week talking to this couple, and I'm not going to say their names, um, but he was telling me that the, this wedding was like the worst wedding of all time. The parents and the family got up in the middle of the wedding and left, <laughs> left the wedding just like, and he's, he's so angry. This dude is so angry. I can see it. It's like only a, it's had been recently. And I'm like, I'm like, you have to forgive them. And, and, and when I said it, I could, his face got angry when I said that. And I'm like, buddy, you're carrying around poison in your own chest. You're, it's like you've been bit by a snake and you're carrying around the poison. I said, you don't have to feel like forgiving them, but you have to at least start by saying, I forgive you. In your prayer time, in your heart. God, whoever those people were, whatever the situation was, I forgive them. I ask you to bless them. I don't feel like it, Pastor. Well, okay, fine. Be in bondage for the rest of your life. You know? Not a great idea. Second area. Unconfessed sin. Unconfessed sin. It's like um, I'm hiding this area, and it, I, I, my memory goes back to it all the time. Maybe it's sexual sin, or maybe it's something else, but like I keep thinking about it, and I'm like, God, I, forgive me, but you haven't confessed it. Confession brings healing. James 5. Confess, therefore, your sins one to another and pray that you may be healed. The supplication or prayer of a righteous man availeth much in its working. Um, the second is uh, interesting. It's unrighteous vows. And this is one that a lot of people don't understand. Vows that you make that are unrighteous can bring a curse on your life. I know it sounds weird, but it's biblical. Here we go. Matthew 5, again, you have heard that it was said of old, you shall not swear falsely, but perform your uh, vows to the Lord. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. And so it's, I mean, it's a very bizarre portion of Scripture because you kind of like, why are you, okay, don't, don't vow, all right? Uh, but why are you then saying all this stuff? Because when you make a vow, I will never, you make yourself the ruler of the universe. I am in charge of everything, and I will never. And that's why it says here, don't make a th a, a, an oath by heaven, for it's God's throne, the earth, it's his footstool, the city, it's his city as well. And don't even do it by your own head, because you can't change whether your hairs are either... They didn't have hair changing color dye back then, but you know what, you get the point. You don't have control over whether you're gonna have a stroke tomorrow. I have a pastor friend who's been working out like an animal. He's got workout classes, he, he's unvaxxed, <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a healthy guy, and he had a massive stroke a couple of days ago. I'm like, you don't have control. And so when you make a vow, you say, I am in control of the universe, and you partner with hell, actually, frankly. And so I want to tell you a story about a vow that I made one time when I was uh, younger and, and broke. And, uh, well, the vow I made when I was very young, and it affected me until I was probably 33, almost a decade ago. Um, so the vow was, I, I, I got this eight years old, I think, maybe nine, year, near, nine years old. I had a, an aunt give me a $20 bill for my birthday. And... $20 bill in the late 80s was a lot of money. It was like $1,000 today. It's an inflation joke. Um, and so we opened up a savings account, put the money in the savings account, and um, with a family member, and I, you know, a couple of weeks later, I asked the family member, hey, I want to get this money out of, get a couple of bucks out, and I need to buy whatever, a G.I. Joe or whatever. And then, no, 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 no. And this kept happening for like maybe two months. And then at the end of the two months, this family member was like, I, you have no money in that savings account. I took the money out of that savings account. Stop talking to me about it. In a screaming, cursing manner to nine -year -old, my nine-year-old self. 
And I remember at the moment, obviously you're devastated as a little kid, sure, right? But I remember at the moment saying, I don't care about money. And I won't care about money ever again. And so when I was, I, when I was a teen, I used to say all the time, I don't care about money. I don't care about it. And then through my 20s, I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't care about money. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care about money. <laughs> you get married and you start saying, I actually do care, I think, about money. <laughs> and even though practically I did, I had this internal vow that I had made. And so I was at an event with um, a, a, another believer. And I was talking about finances. And, this other, the, and he looked at me. He's like, he's like you have some serious problems in your relationship with money. It's like, like a curse or like something seriously wrong. You, I, you need to go home and pray about it and ask God to, to show you what's, what's, what the deal is here. And so he was like from the Dominican Republic, multimillionaire guy, you know? He was like, how are you 10 years ago in New York City as a lawyer and, and, and just barely making it? How is that possible? He's like, and I'm an idiot from the Dominican, and I'm a multimillionaire. He's like, something wrong here. And so I, I'm very angry that he said that. <laughs> but I know it's true. And so I went home, and I just prayed a very simple prayer in faith. I said, Holy Spirit, this sounds right. I need you to speak to me and show me whatever the heck this is. And I go to sleep that night, and I wake up the, the next morning. As soon as I woke up, I had that memory. I hadn't remembered it in truly over, you know, decades. You don't remember those small moments. And I remember saying, I don't care about money. I felt like the Holy Spirit said, I've, I've not just called you to care about money. I've called you to be a steward of my resources so that you would bless your family and the world, world around you. If you don't care about it, I can't give it to you because you won't steward it. And so what's the process? Forgiveness, family member, God, I forgive them, bless them, heal them, and for, heal me. Exactly, repentance, God, I'm sorry that I was saying this vow for the last 30 whatever years. Heal me, change me, and um, my life is significantly different in the area of finances. I mean... Certainly, I read a gajillion books post that time on finances, but just also just practically, I've learned how to steward resources more. I mean, even our churches, our small church is an example of that. We have lots of resources in our church, and we've, been, we've stewarded them really well, and God has blessed us. But like, God is not going to bless you in an area where you say, I just don't care about this, God. Like, Great. Well, then why would I bless you there? And the enemy's sneaky because he gets in in areas of pain and he tries to make us feel self-righteous, right? I'm going to be the holiest pastor that doesn't care about money at all. It's like, no, actually, you're an irresponsible pastor. You know? Yeah. And so vows are the third way that we can bring curses in our life. How can we appropriate the blessing? Um... First, we need to know that we are called to walk in God's blessing and grow in God's blessing. This is not, this is not prosperity message. This is the Bible, God's word. Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you would know the hope of which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance to his holy people when they're all dead. No, it doesn't say when they're all dead. That we would grow in the blessing of God here, now, alive. So we know that we're called to be blessed by God. This no word in the Greek means not just knowing up here. It actually means to grasp it. It's like you can know it up here, but it's different to grasp it. Oh, real quick, um, just because you looked at me, Carlton. If you're in a place and your finances are disastrous, please take Carlton's course. Uh, it's brilliant, and it's not only brilliant, it's actually correct. And so, right? Take your course? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good chatter back. Okay. Know that you're called to be blessed. Second, ask for forgiveness. That's what the whole new covenant is about, that we get forgiveness. That's it. We're not in the rat race that I have to be perfect on all of these levels. You're not going to be. Ask for forgiveness. Third, confess sin. If you've got hidden stuff, you've got disastrous stuff that, I mean, if you're anything like me, you have lots of disastrous stuff. Confess it. Third, um, finally, 
or let me just throw this out there. Don't confess it to your friend that you sin with. Confess it to somebody, older brother in Christ, mom in Christ, dad in Christ, pastor. Go up, yeah, in confession, not down. I, uh, j- uh, another freebie on that point. I have this pastor that was always like confessing his sins to his kids that, that he, they weren't involved in. Like, what are you doing, man? No, it's not appropriate. You're saddling them with a burden like my parents are freaking disaster. Excuse me for saying freaking. I, I repent right now. Uh, <laughs> I confess. My parents are disaster. They're not trustworthy. And I watched all those kids, like the majority of those kids really struggle with their faith. It's not that way. It's like, be wise about confession, right? Amen? Amen. Okay, then finally, declare God's promises. Look at this in Joshua 1.8. What an incredible scripture. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according all that is written. Uh, in the context of New Testament understanding, obviously, right? For then you will make, then you will make your way. <laughs> it's pretty cool. You will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Worship team, come up. Church, why don't you stand with me? Galatians. Jesus came to cancel the curse. 10, you rely on the works, you're under a curse. 11, 12 says the same thing. 13, it says, but Christ redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. And that comes from an Old Testament story of the Israelites, and they're complaining. I love uh, the Amara clip where she says, you're excommunicated, and then her dad says, why? And she says, complaining. (laughs) It's just, it's funny, but in the desert, God sends, he gets so annoyed that the people of Israel are just complaining all the time. He's like, yeah, I'm going to kill a bunch of you, you know? It's like, no, complaining's fine. I'm just, I just want it to be better, really. Moses, <laughs> I just really want it to be better. I'm going to tell all my friends about it. It's like, God doesn't like complaining. Um, and so anyway, the snake, he sends snakes through the people, and they start biting the people. And there's, they're called fiery serpents. Like, it's like poison gets on the inside of them. It's actually kind of like complaining and bitterness of heart. It's all related. And so... Moses is like, Lord, can you please stop killing everyone? And the Lord's like, all right, fine. And the Lord says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this bronze serpent, and I want you to put it on a pole and lift it up. Everybody that casts their eyes on the serpent, I'm going to heal them. And it is, in part, a prophetic picture of Jesus who became a curse for us. And it's a perfect picture of Galatians that Paul you know, by the power of the Holy Spirit, artfully weaves into this. Because it's like, he doesn't say like, tell the people of Israel to do X, Y, Z. Here's this list of deeds that they have to do. It just says that they have to cast their eyes on the pole. They just have to look to Jesus. That's for us. You don't have to have it perfect right now. You just say, Jesus, be my deliverance. I set my gaze upon you. I open the door of my heart to you. And he wants to heal you and deliver you and save you and bless you. And he became the curse so you didn't have to be cursed. That's how good he is. Amen, church.